three performances only about live performance. It's uh, it's bound up with documentation or or how you understand what the performance is that you're tr attempting to re-perform. I would make a, 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 a I would suggest a case for it being um, uh, different and separate to reenactment. But maybe we open up the discussion there before I get before I throw all my sweets on the table. <laughs> we look back at the 60s and 70s work and we see them, as Amelia Jones talks about, it, these grainy black and white photographs in books. These wonderful emblems of, uh, of an event that happened. They're not definitive in any way. We, we, we all know, we all understand photograph, pho uh, photography to be a, a, a millisecond of, of a capture of the moment. But they've become uh, iconic artworks. Um, and so how then do we un... There was a question of how to engage with those further. How do we engage with um, Joseph Boyce's conversation with the dead about conversations on paintings about with the dead? Explaining pictures to dead. Hair. Explaining pictures. To dead hair. Jeez, do you think I'd know this? Uh, sorry. Um, you, how do we re-engage with that? We all know the iconic image of him with the, the hair, uh, with the gold leaf on his head, and it's kind of the mother and child image. Uh, but what else happened in that? Did he sit there? Then we think he sat there for, of course, the time isn't specified either. It's all very grainy and blurry. And we're giving this snapshot of a beautifully composed image to represent that work. So how do we reinvestigate that? And, and a possibility emerged, I think, maybe early, 21st century, around 2000, I don't know, uh, I'm not an art historian, but uh, uh, to look at it, to, to some try and re-enact re it, re-perform it, I think that the terms are pretty loose. I propose a complete distinction between the two now, but um, uh, to see what what happened. Then you, literally, a documentation from the news, like the six o'clock news went out and took some video footage or film footage of the piece and it, it's like two minutes film footage or um, TV reportage. So again, not a document, not an artwork, not a documentation, some mm. kind of funky news <coughs> reportage. And it turns out that it's in, it's, it's in his um, commercial gallerist's place all the furniture has just been pushed back to the edge of the room. Uh, Boyce is performing mostly on top of drawers that hold um, drawings. He's at the window, there's crowds at the window, very engaged, but he makes so many different um, actions throughout it. But the, the one that became the iconic one is him cradling the, cradling the hair. So there's so much more to investigate with, with uh, I would suggest, such an important piece of, 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 of live performance. And I think uh, uh, those channels proposed a further ex exploration of those and how, how, how can we further explore these things. You know, the choices are interview people about a, a very anthropological methodology or just, or try and do it, you, taking the embodied choice, putting the body back in there and exploring what a body can do in time. It's not without its problems. One of the things that happens in, uh, well, culture, yeah. Western culture particularly maybe, uh, and Western influence cultures that we tend to commodify everything, we tend to materialize everything, and uh, we're tending to objectify performance. And one of the key aspects of performance art is that it's, um, it's functioning beyond the realm of commodification, but certain aspects that attend it, i.e., you know, photographs or uh, 
videos and so on, documentation, um, can be used in certain ways where increasingly these traces or aspects that have to do with the work but are not the art itself are becoming regarded as valuable, so to speak. And there's this kind of creeping commodification of performance art. So I think performers have to be, it's okay so long as one's very, very aware of this process that's taking place and we don't lose the heart of the art. The heart of the art is beyond commodification. Many people got into performance art to start off with because they were against uh, art being uh, objectified. Uh, for them it was maybe more a spiritual practice rather than cultural real estate based practice. Um, so uh, uh, we have to be aware of what's taking place. Uh, as I get older, I can see that there's all kinds of uh, interesting, uh, subtle interfusions uh, into the heart of art and draining out um, I can see what's taking place. But we live in what you know people might call loosely a post postmodern culture where everything's flattened, all the values are on the surface. And, uh, um, we're bombarded with imagery from the effects of performance art and uh, there's all these kind of interfusions of theatre, dance and so on as well as fine art within to, into the arena of performance art and uh, there's this kind of interfused flux. But it's really important for practitioners to be aware of roots, the heart, not just the surface. Um, and to be clear, you know, uh, where he or she stands in relation. The surface is also important, but uh, the heart of art, don't lose that. I mean, do you think that's something that is, is, is agreed? You know, well, I mean, I'm not, there's I'm, a sort I'm, of... I'm not even sure it's agreed, I'm not even sure uh, in the current situation, people are aware. I mean, I, I would say this also to people doing painting, you know? There, there can be a, a kind of a double feedback um, in the same way because the, the, um, uh, the currency involved in human culture is states of mind. And so one of the things that's happening regardless of whether it's a body in a room or fragments of a photograph, a fetishized image, um, what it is is that it becomes a mirror for a set of possibilities for me now as a witness and somebody who is developing as a fellow human being. And uh, in as much as a moment of necessity requires the use of the body in formal fine art to challenge commodification. So there's a lesson to be taken from this, uh, um, taking up this fight, that we then bring out to other forms, because the pyramids are ephemeral, just like the body is. Everything is ephemeral. So what, what's really being transmitted? There's a double feedback. The real fruits to be learned from live art, live embodied, you know, performance art is when we take those lessons out and see them in the city around us. I mean, the, you know, the Iraq war is, is, is a work of performance art. I love that, that comment by Stockhausen after the Twin Towers f fell, um, uh, that it was the, the greatest work of performance art of the 21st century that he then was, got a lot of stick from and, and I, I thought he hit the nail on the head really. Mm -hmm. um, so it's when you take the when you take the principle and apply it as a state of mind when you start to actually live it and see it as a it becomes a living perspective on things rather than a discrete form. That's really what's that's that's really what's the 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 art is doing. That's what it should. That's what its ambition should be. And I think that is what's genuinely possible. Mm -hmm. um, right from my early interest in well not early, but kind of medium interest in performance art. I saw the link uh, between the, um, the kinds of living uh, vows 
that were undertaken by the sadhus in India and saw a very strong correlation between what performance artists do in this culture and those kinds of practices. And it seemed to me that what was going on was that in that culture there's a more, uh, there's a, uh, a fuller understanding that what's going on in these quite kind of bizarre activities is something that's about our shared humanity and even if I don't quite understand what's going on there's something uh, at stake in terms of my own human potential that this person is doing this very odd activity and it's when you start to see this feedback from these experimental pockets of human behavior into the everyday lived reality that's the fruits of life life practice so and you can spend a lifetime in business, but does that mean that your work is any less ephemeral than the work of the performance artist or any more real than the work of the performance artist? It's all the dream time. It's all part of the dream time. Yeah. So, um, so that would be my take. But I think it's uh, shocking and inhumane to uh, incorporate that as in the same breath as performance art, which has got for me to do with uh, uh, humanitarianism. Uh, I can understand what you're talking, I mean, we have people like Michael Stone come bursting into the Stormont and then claiming that as performance. It, it, it devalues humanity, it devalues performance. I mean, I can understand um, there's so much that you could say is performative and, and terrible things that have happened. The hunger strikers were perhaps Perform. There wasn't a lot of performance in those days. Uh, you couldn't com you couldn't compete, if that's the right word, with what they were uh, enduring. But it doesn't mean that it was performance. And I would take exception to uh, a loose use of a, a comparison like that. As Alan Capro mentioned on his happenings. He mentioned that it was the, the Korean War was probably one of the biggest happenings that ever happened, and, and, and in that way, would, would you know class that as what he was talking about was a performance. Just because it's Alan Capro, he can still talk shit. <laughs> that's, that's very true. That's very true. But <laughs> it was just uh, yeah, that's mm. can, can I twist the logic of uh, commodification? If performance art is not to be commodified, then also, by extension, it's not to be property. So, if it's not property, then there is nothing to stop someone looking at this performance art and thinking, I'll do that, and taking that piece and doing that piece with their own audience somewhere. There can be no ownership. Well, that does happen. <coughs> I, mean, I that's suggest that's a good thing. It, 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 it does happen. It does happen. Um, a, lot de a lot depends on the mental attitude of the person who initiated the work, uh, becoming aware that that's taking place. And so yes. Forth. And, and if somebody might actually think that's complementary. Yes, 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 yes. Be used as well. <laughs> well, there's, there's the great um, case in literature of Edward Bond, and um, I think it's in Lear, where, uh, no, it's an early morning where he um, has a character tell a story and say, Go and spread this story. Go and spread this story everywhere. Tell everybody this story. It should belong to everybody. And then Kathy Acker took a section of that and put it in one of her books. And he immediately prosecuted her for plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a long time ago now. But I think um, it implies some serious questions about well, artist property. Yeah, it does. But again, um, well, so, so much depends on the. Uh, specific attitude of the particular performance artist. Mm. I mean, there's no specific or general rule here. I mean, uh, for instance, we do performance work with um, the Beyond. Mm. And if certain combinations of imaging takes place just by a certain kind of confluence of two or three people in spatial p positioning and mm. performative action, and if somebody notices something that uh, you couldn't come up with, say, on a piece of paper or just by themselves, and you see some interfusion you think is really intriguing, well, that person, if he or she wishes, can develop that further in his or her own work. Mm -hmm. Nobody's saying, well, you can't use that. Mm -hmm. No, no. It's, it's, 
chair. Uh, yes. Now, some performance artists might be very unhappy with that. You know, it depends on the attitude of the uh, particular individuals involved. And the potential thief or communicator, depending on how you want to <laughs> look at the. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head, I think, for me, in terms of I'm still trying to round the discussion around to the question of real performance. And it is exactly about that. The, a question about it, not just to engage historically uh, with works, but, but a big question is intellectual property. And, uh, and there's different, I suppose, uh, methods of practicing performance. As, as, as you rightly pointed out, there's a kind of a living it, uh, being it, and a kind of a very, um, uh, a truthful exploration of your lived world um, and uh, a, a way of going in, into process I think when a, a lot of, of practitioners when they came out of traditional art forms painting sculpture sometimes applied that in process methodology as a live uh, in the live moment so you go into the live moment, you try and be as present as possible, listening to the work, listening to the audience, listening to what's happening, and you are there and you're making it up as you go along, as I explained to my mother. But uh, uh, the problem then is, so when we're getting to uh, re-performing works, what the hell do you re-perform? Which part of it? Or how do you take uh, an in-process, long durational performance possibly so even an hour and i just say well the artist walked there and then he you know we're talking about voice and then from the pictures that i saw he picked up the hair and he put it in his mouth and then all of a sudden he got to the window and then he made the beautiful icon oh i have to do that big picture how do you do it um, and also then who owns it and this is all bound up with the, the western world's idea of originality, font of knowledge, the romantic hero, ownership, commodification. I own that, I made that picture first, so therefore it's mine. But performance, live performance complicates that, and I think re-performance complicates. There's also the issue of in re-performance, <coughs> where somebody might think that in order to re-perform someone's performance, that he or she has to use uh, the exact materials in the same exact way you know, that they were utilized in the initial performance. But if it's, the question for me or the issue for me would be, if it's not done in the equivalent spirit within which the artist, the original artist made the performance, uh, I would really question how viable this is as some kind of empathetic take on his or her work. It would be very much like uh, just looking at something from the outside in, not from the inside out, and just giving some kind of external replica of the situation, which could be completely heartless, mindless, soulless. Uh, much depends on uh, how one, if you want, interprets what it means to uh, uh, do another take on some of someone else's performance. That's I, I mean, I could even see, I could even see whereby someone, say, wanting to work from the heart of the work, the spirit of the work, might, in fact, in doing a, um, a re-performance of someone else's performance, use not necessarily even the same materials, but just trying to get at the heart of the matter in an equivalent way. Uh, and this person might still think that he or she is doing a good performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is where I think the um, construct, the, the uh, roles in theater are actually designed for that problem. I mean, it's, you know, it, when you think of reenacting a work or re-performing a work, you're 
approaching it as the viewer, as the outsider, with a particular um, assumption about what was going on on the part of the artist. And isn't that, you know, that's what, that's the job of theater to interpret, you know, either a text or to um, imagine what happened in Shakespeare's time. And the director is outside saying, yes, no, yes, no, or, you know, try this. This is what I feel from it. And it compares to what I feel from, you know, looking at that photo. And it's, it's, a, it's a very particular set of problems to solve about how to, to make something feel a certain way or communicate a certain way. And I, I um, you know, including acting and trying to, to um, make choices that trigger a certain set of emotions that drive the, you know, that the language drives towards a particular conclusion and you, you find a way to get there that seems as if you were doing it for the first time. I mean, those are all theater problems. I don't think that those are um, necessarily what performance art in the classic sense is really um, designed to do. So, you know, you might, you might as a performance artist, um, and I think this is where you say the materials might be really different, as a performance artist, you give yourself a task. You, um, you know, choose a set of materials. You give yourself a problem, and you go for it. And you happen to do it in public. And you might, you you might learn something that you didn't expect. You might discover that the audience thought you were doing something entirely differently than what you felt like you were doing. I mean, there's a whole conversation about what actually just happened. Um, but you don't necessarily know, you don't know what it really will be. You might have some ideas, but where you end up is, is the result of engaging with the problem. I mean, that's one of the main uh, aspects, I think, of performance art, where uh, um, because we're actually doing it live in public, it's different from, say, being in the studio, where, say, I, I keep referencing painting because I started as a painter, and, you know, the convention, you know, you, you work in your studio, and you do a whole bunch of uh, paintings, maybe, and who knows, maybe in a year you have an exhibition of work and you make a selection, whatever. You might even invite a friend who's in judgment you trust, and. Uh, he or she helps you make a selection, and then you have your exhibition. So you basically edited, you know, uh, the, the, the works you've made uh, for the show, and by the time you've done that, with a reasonable attitude, you know, a, re a reasonable sense that uh, it's going to work, you know, that the actual exhibition itself should hold together. But in doing a performance uh, where there's no separation between the artist and the artwork, and the artist is standing back, looking at the thing, you know. As, um, you're giving yourself to the action. You can't say, you don't, even though you might have, you might have prepared a basic structure, but allowing a little uh, elasticity for whatever takes place that you couldn't have anticipated to you can incorporate that. You still can't tell that something's not going to fall from the sky and smash the whole thing, you know. Uh, because you're doing it live and it's not rehearsed in a sense, like in a theatre sense, with a director um, standing behind saying, no, no, try that instead of this or whatever. So you're out there and you're very, very vulnerable. Uh, but for me, this is one of the most important aspects of this because you're actually putting your neck on the line. You're out there, maybe on the street, doing this thing and uh, giving yourself over to it. And um, for me, that's a major uh, difference. Uh, it's different from being in the studio, you know, doing a video or whatever, and you're doing all your editing and stuff and so on, so you're pretty sure that things are going to really work, you know. Um, and what, what do you think it is then that's really at stake in that? Is it, is it the moment? Like, is it the present, or is it the if, possibility of failure, or is it the possibility of fa failure? There could also be a sublime possibility of 
wonderful, beautiful uh, aspects taking place. Circumstantial things could happen that you haven't planned that actually make it sublime. Uh, but there's a big element of risk as well. And it's actually walking the tightrope. You know, you, 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 well, you, 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 you're taking the risk. But it's you're giving with yourself people. over. You're giving yourself as a sign. You're, you, 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 you're letting yourself be used as a signal, as a sign. And you're giving yourself over to that. With a witness. With a witness.